I wanted to be a froglock necromancer. Because I was in EverQuest 1. Yeah, and froglocks... Um, I don't think I ever did a froglock in EverQuest 2. Um, I am. My main, when I started, I was dual boxing a, um, uh, a, a gnome illusionist and a, a wood elf warden. And my ex-partner, she had a paladin, a, a high elf paladin. Um, and we played those characters for like two years, and then we eventually switched over, and I switched over to a Dwarven Guardian, who I then played for the next, like, five years. Um, uh, and that was my raid tank, that I, and she switched over to a High Elf uh, Templar. So, um, but the first two years, like the first two expansions, I played that Warden through all the raid content. Um, and then when Kingdom of Sky came out was when I switched over to the tank. Um, I mean, I have a lot of good memories in EverQuest too, and like I said, we had a really good time when we went back and did it, you know, last year with the with the Saga Lucina gaming community. It's just that because it was the launch version of that progression server, yeah, everybody rushed to the cap, and it was like after two weeks, everybody's like, "We're level fifty, and there's nothing to do." And it's like, I'm only level thirty, and I've still got <laughs> plenty of stuff to explore. It's not my fault that you guys just did a power level rush to fifty. Yeah. Um, but since it's your first time playing. Um, I would almost say don't follow any guides and just follow whatever quests they're sending you on. And if you ever get to the point where you're running out of content, Thanks for the do those heritage quests. Do the heritage quests because, oh my god, they're good. Really, really, really good. All right, yeah, we'll have to look into those. Um, Gunter hadn't mentioned it. What? Gunter hadn't mentioned it. Yeah, we have a guy in our chat who comes every stream. He's like a, he, he's, I think he's like 51 years old, he said. And he knows, like, anytime anybody asks any question about EverQuest 1 or 2, and even some he other knows. games, he just tells us. <laughs> well, some of us, I'm only 40, but I've lived, you know, I started playing EverQuest 1 when it came out. I was 19 years old. Um, I started about two months after it launched, because um, I was at the Star Wars Festival, the first Star Wars Festival in Denver, Colorado, and I was in line for the Lego store to blow a bunch of money on Legos. And these guys behind me and I got to talking about Dungeons & Dragons and stuff, and they um, they were talking about, hey, have you tried this new game that's come out called EverQuest? And I was like, what? Tell me more. <laughs> and that's when I started. And so I've grown up with it now. I'm not nearly as knowledgeable as some people, but yeah, I mean, I lived it for 14, 15 years, both of those games. It's a lot of really good content. Kind of jealous. All right. <laughs> well, you'll you'll get caught up now that you're playing it for the first time. Um, you said you're playing a Froglock Necromancer. What are you playing, Himbar? Um... Well, now I'm a Shadow Knight, uh, half-elf. Dude, Shadow Knights are... Dude, the Shadow Knight... So the coolest thing about the Shadow Knight is as you start to level up, especially as you start to get your AA points and put them in to the AoEs and stuff, those guys become, like, the ultimate AoE tank because you can just walk into something and just hit them with your life taps and all your dots and everything. And, your, and it's just like you just mow them down. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. I'm, I'm liking it way more than the Paladin, personally. Yeah, the Paladin's pretty boring. Um, unless you... You know, the Paladin's more of a tank and spank, kind of mm -hmm. straight up tank and spank kind of character. But the Shadow Knight, you can really do a lot of damage. And it's meant to be that AoE tank that just wanders in and just, you know, dots everything. <laughs> um, it's it's a really cool class. Um, that's actually what I was playing in this last, um, when we did the TLP uh, progression server last year in March or whenever it was. Um, I rolled a Shadow Knight for that to lead the guild that time. Yes, do the like Theater Alpha saying definitely do the event quests and etc. But um, I, like I said, for my money, it's always been the heritage quests. I love doing them because they're so involved and there's so much lore behind them, and you get sent to places that are from EverQuest One, and you're getting these cool items that are like have been passed down the generations. Um, that that's what it was. Thank you, signature, signature. quests. I said heirloom. I was wrong. Heirloom. <laughs> It's signature quests. It's the signature quests and the heritage quests. Those are the two to focus on. Because those are like the really long involving. So once you guys get your feet underneath you and you've gotten to like level 30 and you're looking for some other stuff to do, heritage quests and um, uh, signature quests. You okay. like Alice in Wonderland a little bit. Yeah, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> but yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, we'll definitely check all that stuff out. I'm going to have to ask our boy Gunter about that stuff because he loves teaching us so um and if you've right. got somebody go take them yeah use that knowledge because there's a lot of stuff there to play through and the housing system 
is really cool in that game too because i have a house on everquest one <laughs> yeah the housing Not system too. in Ever everquest 2 is a lot better than <laughs> oh, right. i think to this date honestly there's a lot of people that still play eq2 just for the housing because it's probably one of the better housing systems on the market even after all these years and that you can place a lot of stuff in there um Yes, it is one of the best housing systems like Theater Elf is saying. I love the fact that you could take your old Heritage Quest items after you finish using them and they're no longer useful. You can right click on them and choose to mount it and then you can place it in your house somewhere. So you have this air, you know, this memory of things that you've done in the game and you can place these really things cool. all around your house. And then like huh. the, the uh, you know, looking for our own game which I know we'll dive into here in a minute, but uh, the guild system in EverQuest 2 is what we're looking at for our guild management system because the things you can do in that game in terms of you could have it, once you get your guild going, your guild has levels and you can progress up through those levels. You could do guild raids. You have all these cool like things you can get from doing the quest. You get these, I think they're called, I forget the points that you get from doing the, the heritage quests and stuff. But again, it's been a long time since I've played Dedicated. That That is such a good game, so. You should join us sometime on stream. <laughs> <laughs> if I had time, like I literally quit playing World of Warcraft Classic last month because I, I have no time anymore. Um, it's literally the only time I get to do any games right now is when I get up in the morning. Um, I've been playing God of War on the PS4 for the second time, and cool. I'll get a couple hours in in the mornings. And by the time my wife gets up, she's got classes, and then after she has classes, because she's quarantined like everybody else, yeah. she's in Netflix mode right now. So <laughs> I'm like, you just do Netflix. I'll, I'll work on stuff here. And I got so much stuff we're doing anyway. So it's... Yeah, I bet. Well, Otherwise, that, I would. Then that we can use that to, uh, I guess, segue. segue into some of our first questions here. So, um, well, Introductions first, I'd say. Yeah, oh, that's true. Introductions. So, well, you guys... do you want to introduce yourself first then? I'm Tim. You know, this is this is the first time I've streamed with you guys, so I think a lot of the people who will come in will probably know who I am. Yeah. But uh, and for those who watch this later, I'm Tim Anderson, aka Renfill from Stormhaven Studios, working on the Saga of Lucemia, which is an MMORPG from our company. Yes, it is, and we'll deal. We'll delve into that a little bit. Get some more specifics on that. But um, I'm Arvizek. This is Hemvar. Uh, our real names are Liam and Cullen. We are. Pretty much just starting our Twitch channel, Hemvar and Arvizek, but we have a YouTube channel that's been up for 10 years now, literally, and uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so we, uh, I guess I didn't really get into Saga see me until, oof, I guess it wasn't even that long ago. It was about a year ago. Probably about a year. And then, but this one. I'm sure he'll want to talk about it right now, so I'll let him do that. You have a shirt on, I think. Yes, he does. It's hard, it's hard to see because you're not close enough. Get up get up close to the camera for a minute. I want to see which one. shirt that is. Oh, okay. That's the length of rope. Yeah, but which length of rope shirt it's is the, it? It's the hoodie from the Indiegogo. It's got the old yeah, but, logo on the back. Yeah, what's the front? Yeah, but I, it's a little dark, so I can't see what the front actually yeah, it is. It says the gate, the wall hole. White hole. Oh! Oh, yeah, oh, I know what shirt that is now. So <laughs> those shirts, by the way, those shirts, so you have been around for a while because those shirts, I think we sold those shirts either late 2014 or early 2015 was we did, was when we did the length of rope um, shirts that we did. Because we did that one. We did the, the outhouse okay. one where I dropped my sword in the, in the latrine. What can I do oh, if only I had a length of rope? So we did the wall, we did the outhouse, and I think there was another one we did. I think there was three shirts that we did with the length of rope. Um, so you have been around for a while. Yeah, I, I, I started following back in 2014. I don't even remember how I found out about you guys. So. Yeah, that's been a while. Hi, humanoid. So kudos for the shirt. I don't, to, as, to be honest, I don't even have any of those shirts. <laughs> um, my brother has some of those shirts. Um, I forget why I didn't order any. I think it's because I was... Chris and I were here, and then we were going to Spain to work with the Costa Brava Tourism Board at the time, like around the time that we were starting to sell the shirts. And so it was just going to be too much of a hassle to get them shipped because we were on the road. Mm -hmm. And so I just never ordered any, and I never, I never even never dawned on me to like order extras for <laughs> myself because I have a bunch of the other shirts that we sold, but just not those ones. So you have a rare item because um, I think we only did one round of those like six years ago. Sell on Hold on to that. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> Vintage. <laughs> All right. Um, so, 
I, the first question we wanted to ask, because we know that some people are kind of... So, it's just... <laughs> it's hard to even state or say, but... Um, so, basically, the first question is, do you consider, you know, the game Saga Leucemia to be a crowdfunded game? Um, not really. Um, I would say the easiest answer to that is the first two years, um, we did private it was all us we just self-funded everything for the first two years and then we did we opened a pre-order store in september 2015 and that uh, allowed us to mitigate some of the out-of-pocket expenses um, and eventually got to the point where it was paying for all of the business expenses but we started getting investors on board at the end of 2017 when we were at the austin game conference which was two years after so we did two years of self-funding two years of partial self partial pre-order but then we started getting investors when we went to the austin game conference and since the end of 2017 we've been investor only funded so no not really it's a weird hybrid thing because a lot of people assume that because we have a pre-order store and we sell packages that we're crowdfunded but that's not actually the case we're actually investor funded um, self-funded for the first couple of years, partially crowdfunded for a couple of years, and then investor-funded for like the last f three years, four years. Um, and then with where we're at now, I mean, it's it's basically just been all the investors since 2017, since the end of 2017. Um, so I wouldn't consider us a traditional crowdfunded, no. Um, we do keep the Twitter store there as, I mean, we mentioned this pretty much when we talk about it, it's a barrier of entry that we don't just get people um, because we don't we don't need people if we just needed people we would open up everything and have it be this massive thing and and do invites for things but we much prefer having a barrier of entry because we make sure that we're getting the people who are here for the right reasons because most people they just want free stuff and so yes. when you get when you give away free stuff like that and you're getting people into your game who are there because it's free they're not there to look for bugs and test they're there because oh it's something free for me to play yeah. um, when we have a barrier of entry in place it ensures that the people who are joining are there for the right reasons and also i think something that we've done which i'm gonna you know pat ourselves on the shoulder at the moment you can look at a lot of other crowdfunded games and traditionally the access point to be able to play in their alpha is hundreds of dollars in yep. and ours is ours ours the pre-alpha was 40 bucks like 40 bucks you could get in and you could play our game the moment you you got into the pre-alpha um and then now that we're in stage three we've, we've raised that to 60 which is a little different now when we did it for 40 it was because we literally had nothing and so it was more of this you know if you want to support us that's great cool you know, but we're going to keep that barrier of entry really low. And then now we actually have something. We have a reputation now, and et cetera. We've been able to adjust that price up by 20 bucks, um, and so now it's 60. But 60 bucks is still a fairly low price point considering what most other companies are charging for alpha access. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, agree. I agree. <laughs> I put a, I paid a lot of money for some other games, so. <laughs> oh, I've I've paid. I, I talked about this probably, man, it might have been two years ago now, year and a half, two years ago now. There was a thread, I want to say I'm like massively OP, where they were talking like, how much do you spend per year on gaming? And I was like, uh, <laughs> uh probably a few thousand dollars a year. Like, I, I don't, so everybody has a hobby, right? Everybody's got primary hobbies in life. And my two primary hobbies are traveling and um, gaming. And so gaming has been my my primary hobby for like since i was a kid you know you guys are a lot younger than i like i grew up so in the 80s you know we had text-based games and then we got into like the first uh adventure games which were all you know you had to type commands in like uh, quest for glory 2 as an example in the early king's quest games and then we got into the point and click stuff in the early 90s and so i kind of grew up with those adventure games and everything else so i've been gaming you know my whole life basically so for me the gaming is this hobby where it's like I have no qualms throwing down, you know, three five hundred dollars a month on games because that's literally the only thing I spend disposable income on and travel. Um, and my wife and I don't, we don't need. So these are those cool things that I've talked about elsewhere, but I'll talk about it for your community. Like when you live in a place like we live in a big city, we don't need a vehicle because there's Uber, 
and there's the train and there's buses and there's taxis and there's the metro like there's all these ways to get around you don't need a vehicle when you can live in a big city so when you don't need a vehicle and you don't have the cost associated with owning a vehicle and insurance and gas and all that stuff like you start getting ready of all these things that cost money and you have a lot more disposable income at your at your disposal um and that's just where i've chosen to spend my money so i'm with you on that point and that you know i've spent a lot more than 60 bucks to get into <laughs> some uh to get into some alphas uh, but i'm fine with that because i like games and that's what i do yeah. um so yeah yeah it seems reasonable to me we we actually had a guy join our stream the other day his name is zd rogue and he told us that he had put over a thousand dollars into a game just to get into the alpha and i was like "Ooh, buddy i don't i don't think i've ever done that much to get into an alpha but i've definitely dropped three to five hundred dollars on projects um <laughs> over the years could. here and there um more recently i tend not to do it for triple a stuff mm -hmm. um so as an example the reason i don't uh, here's a good example because right now like for example, Last of Us 2 and Cyberpunk 2077 are coming out. And you could totally buy like the deluxe packages that are like, I don't know, 180 bucks or $200 or something. And you get all these cool things with that. I don't really care about that because I know the game's going to be good. Yeah. And all I really care about is the game. So I've, I've only bought like the base levels of that. But then there are other projects like uh, Baldur's Gate 3. Like when Baldur's Gate 3 becomes available for pre-order, I'm going to throw a boatload of money at that product. <laughs> yeah. um, because I love Larian Studios and it's Baldur's Gate 3. Like I have complete confidence in that team to pull it off and I want all the perks for that game. So I'm totally going to throw like three or $400 at that or whatever it ends up being um, for like whatever's like the deluxe or collector's edition. So yeah, yeah but I don't think I would spend a thousand dollars to get alpha access to something. <laughs> I so. am not even capable of doing that. <laughs> All right. Um, did you want to ask any questions right now, Leo? I was just thinking for the uh, just like the general things that you've probably gone over a million times. So I would see me as a group based MMO, and so how much is like the content sellable? So I think the easier way to think of that, um, Arvizek, you said you played EverQuest one. Hembar, did you play EverQuest one? Yes. Did, when when did you play EverQuest one? That's a better question. Well, yeah, when it was soloable. <laughs> yeah. So there's when when I played EverQuest one, you know, in the early days of EQ one, um, like launch through the first like, basically up to Planes of Power, which was what the fourth expansion I think, and it's like my favorite expansion, the the Luklin, Luklin Moon expansion, and Planes of Power for me like, um, those were fourth and fifth I guess because it was launch Kunark. Uh, Velius, Lookland, and then Planes of Power. Velius was amazing. Like, Kunark for me was never that awesome. Uh, Velius was really cool. The Moon expansion was amazing, etc. Um, so the way it worked in EverQuest 1 was that your solo ability depended heavily on what class you had. As an example, a warrior not going to have the same amount of solo ability as, say, a necromancer, because a necro can fear kite. And then if you're an enchanter, you can have a pet which helps you fight. Or if you're a mage, you have a pet that helps you fight. And if you're a druid, you can root things and dot them. So different classes had different levels of solo ability. But the solo ability of players was only ever in outside zones and only ever in certain sections of zones. Um, there were camps that you just couldn't take on if you were a solo player, regardless of your class. Um, and then there were, you know, like the druid or the wizard could did what we called quad kiting which you could go in and pull like four or five mobs i think it was four because i think that was the limit that you could your dots could hit but you would or your your aoes but you would pull four mobs get them all snared run around in a circle until they're all grouped up into one little area and then you would hit them with aoes until they all die hmm. um no other classes could do that except the wizard and the druid so you know there was lots of solo ability depending on what the character role you played but only ever in the outdoor settings once you got into dungeons forget about it unless you're way over leveled and um you know and, and and when i say dungeons i don't mean the entrance you know pretty much anyone can go into the entrance pull the first couple of mobs and handle that but if you're talking about actually going into the dungeon and the depths of the dungeon you always needed a group if you were on level doing the content as it was meant to be played um so i'd say our game is very similar in that aspect and like you can go out into the open world 
and you can find little pockets of the zone where you can go out and progress your character's abilities. But if you ever want to do dungeons, and every single quest line in the game will take you into a dungeon, um, then you're going to need groups. Um, you're going to need groups of other people to complete those quests. Um, so, since we're going to need groups, what exactly are you aiming for in terms of group size for just, like, your average dungeon? Um, six to eight. Like, I think the, the bulk of the content will be designed for, like, five to six players, but we have eight-man parties so that you can bring along your friends who have never played or might be a little under leveled um but still want to come along for the ride or your utility people who aren't going to do that much dps but you still want them there um to hold the torch for you or you want your crafters there because they need to you need a crafter to open up a certain door or to help you with a bridge or some sort of a drawbridge mechanic um but as far as like what you need for your core adventuring you know you probably need five to six people for most of the content in terms of dungeons Okay, and um, I assume there's plans for raids at some point. Mm -hmm. And what would be the group size for that? Yeah, yes, that yeah, we haven't confirmed that yet. Um, I think we're looking at two to three groups. Two to so, three full groups. Yeah, so sixteen to twenty-four people. Um, I you know I I did a lot of raiding at EverQuest two over the years. Um, that's when we had our top ten worldwide guild for seven years throughout EverQuest two, and I felt like 24 was a good number like beyond 24 and it was just too much um yeah. world of warcraft had 40 man raids and i just i never really liked 40 man it just felt too big to me um the 24 man raids felt good the other thing i really appreciated about everquest 2 was they had tiered stuff so you would have some stuff that was meant to be done with a group of two um or excuse me uh two groups and then other stuff that was targeted for three groups and other that was targeted for four groups so i think for us you know i think probably see a lot of the mid-tier stuff is going to require two groups so 16 people and then the sort of final quests and most of these quest chains are going to get to the point where there's um you're going to need you know three groups of people um and so along with um like the raids it, what would what saga would see me as in game kind of we don't really have an end game and i'm going to answer i want to answer a question in chat here in a minute before i get into that cool. um Gloth Drogon is saying enchanters could solo boss mobs in dungeons i would disagree with that if you're talking about on level on par at the time the content was launched if you're talking two three years after and the person had alternate advancement points and everything else then absolutely you could come in and solo drusilla and 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 so on and so forth but I was there, you know, in Kunark when it launched, and there was no way that someone was going in and and soloing that content when it first came out. Um, but you know, later on, as players got their epic weapons and stuff, totally. Um, but to answer your question more about you know raid content, there, you know, we've talked about there isn't really end game in our game because there's no mandatory quests, there's no experience points, there's none of that stuff going on. So it's really just about, here's this world, here's this setting, what do you want to do? What's in game for you? Is your group, like if you're, you're playing with your brother, obviously, I'm just, you know, for most of the time, I don't know if you guys have other family members or friends that play with you, but it's kind of like, what is your goal for your group? Is your goal to explore dungeons? Then that's what you do. And you guys become a dungeon crawling party. Um, or do you guys want to follow the quest line for the for the Aiden Than and you want to help them and do that faction line and run those quests, or do you want to actually follow the volume one quest line and get into the, you know, what's going on with the world, bringing magic back, so on and so forth? Um, in that sense, there is the traditional progression of, you know, if you look at the volume one storyline content for the quests, it's definitely a progression of you can do some parts solo, you can do some parts duo and trio, you're going to need four to six for some stuff, you're going to need a full group for some stuff, you're going to need two groups for some stuff, and you're going to need three groups for the end of those quest lines. So in that sense, there is an end, there's the point A and a point B to that quest line, but I hesitate to call it end game because we're actually building a virtual world as opposed to a theme park. Because if you look at like 
most games, even EverQuest 2, which I know you guys are playing right now, EverQuest 2 is very much a theme park style game. It's about quest hubs. Yeah. So you're going quest hub to quest hub to quest hub to quest hub, like every other MMORPG on the market. And so it's a very, you know, it's a very streamlined experience so you're literally always going from a point a to point b and when you have a scene uh, this world where it's just a setting which is kind of like whatever quest was um you don't have to do that content if you don't want to you can go off and do all these other things um and in that way you can avoid ever having the end of the game ever come about because there's just so much that you can always be doing that doesn't rely upon pursuing a single quest line yeah. And that's that's one thing I loved about EverQuest and even D and D. Yes, yeah, D and D. And we, I've talked about this a lot because I like I like people to think of our game as more table G oh. because I can have uh, modules set up right, or, or I can be playing off of a module, and I could be sitting down DMing that campaign and have the module set up. But my players could decide that they don't want to follow what's been laid out in that campaign or the roll of the dice could send things off in a completely different direction and so as a dm you have to be prepared for that but also as a player you have the choice do i follow the campaign setting and follow this module or do i go off and explore this other stuff and now everyone's reacting to dice rolls um and and the spontaneous role play of the situation um that's something that i find personally far more appealing um in terms of what I like to see in a game. And as much as I love a game like Star Wars The Old Republic because it's Star Wars and I love that lore and I love that universe, that game is very much oh, yeah. on the rails. You really can't do anything outside of, well, guess what? You're level 20. The only thing to do is go to Tatooine. Like, you're locked into only doing that one yeah. thing as opposed to our world. It's like, oh, your, your masteries are here. Well, guess what? There's, you know, 10 to 15 different places you could go and explore. It's up to you where do you go sure so with that being said if my group was in interested in doing basically exclusively dungeons um that would mean that at some point and probably you know semi-regularly at least new dungeons would have to be added right yes so is there plans to make regular content updates when the game is out yeah so i think the current plan um, everybody's got access to the world map, so I know you guys have seen the world map. Um, the bottom half of the world map is kind of what we're looking for as the launch version of the game. Um, and once that's launched, we're then going to be going around the rest of the map and just adding stuff to that between the launch of Volume 1 and launch of Volume 2. Probably quarterly we're looking at, so every quarter we'd like to think that we'll draw a new dungeon, a new zone. Um, maybe not both at the same time, but we'll definitely be launching either a new zone or a new dungeon every three months, more than likely, is what the schedule is going to be. Cool. Until we fleshed out the top half of the map, and then we get into Volume 2 stuff, which is Gleznaradin, which is the underground kingdom of the Dwerhe, the mountain regions of the the dragons and some other stuff. So that's that's all volume two stuff, which is a long, long way away. <laughs> so, I mean, speaking about that, I assume when you say the volumes of the the quest, because you said there was going to be the main main quest, quote unquote, mm -hmm. following the volume one. Um, that's based on the books, right? Yes. And yes. Um, how many books are you guys planning on releasing? Just four for now. I mean, well, let us let me rephrase that. Um, the game content is following the four books that I'm writing, but we've got other books that we're contracting out to other authors. We've also got stuff that we're doing in the tabletop world with the tabletop game that we're going to be working with other people on. Ooh. So you can think of it more like Dragonlance or Forgotten Realms in that there's a lot of content that's going to be coming out, but the game is only ever going to focus on the books that I'm writing. Sure. Oh, cool. I love tabletop games. <laughs> uh, all right. That's that's a work in progress. That's um, literally the most last back burner thing. Um, hey. I've had the outlines ready for a year and a half now, but I just don't have the time to work on it. Um, the guy we're talking with right now is actually working with Ed Greenwood on a project. Ed Greenwood is creator of Forgotten Realms. Um, so once he wraps up that project, we're hoping to bring him back and have him work on our project for a bit. And you know, in a in a perfect world, we'll have the tabletop out around 
you know, probably a year after the game goes live, but you know, it just depends on everybody's schedules. So I got patience. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in term, let's get back to the game itself. Um, in terms of like, uh, I don't like, so yesterday, for example, I was playing on the TLE on EverQuest two and there was a quest where I had to go underwater. Right. Mm. And I was fighting enemies in the water, and I was wondering if there's going to be anything like that in Saga Leucemia, because yeah. that's not it's realistic. not in It's not in right now, because it's just it's an engineering thing to get underwater combat the way we want it to be. So right now you can only swim on the surface. Sure. Uh, but yeah, underwater content is absolutely planned, because no good MMORPG doesn't have it. Like, you have to have good water, underwater stuff. It's just, it's it adds another level to things, it's more complex. You know, you gotta now. People have to think about, oh, I need enduring breath items so that I can breathe underwater, and I need spells or items that can help me breathe underwater, or I need to get make a potion, or it just adds a whole other level to gameplay. And you can't move the same underwater, so it's a whole other level of fighting mechanics that you have to think about. So, yeah, absolutely. And something about that as well in um, World of Warcraft and Cataclysm, I think they added that big underwater zone name I can't remember, but they added a that seahorse mount, right? That was underwater only. So that's another question. Are we going to have mounts in this game? No. no. No, not at all. No. We um we looked at in the very early days we thought about mounts. Um and then about 2 years ago we just decided that we weren't going to do it because there's there's a certain component, you know, we want players relying on each other. Sure. At all times. And so it's nice to think about, well, if I, if I want to move more quickly through the world, I either need to get the ability for myself or I need to rely upon another player to do that for me. And because you have to make choices about the masteries you take, you can't be the everything man. Yeah. Like, you have to pick. So if you're a warrior, more than likely you've gone with a bunch of sword and shield or two-handed weapon type things, and you're not necessarily going to have those speed buffs like a bard of wood or the type of ranger kind of build and things of that nature. So we always want players relying on each other as often as possible. And the moment that you introduce mounts into the game, I don't have to deal with anybody. Sure. I can literally just click a button, excuse me, and now I can go anywhere I want as quickly as I want, and I don't need other people. Sure, especially so, with two-seater mounts. <laughs> yes, so we didn't want to do mounts for that reason. And also because the moment you add mounts, it just makes the world smaller. And we want our world to be big at all times so it's it's one of those things where it is a conscious decision that we're not going to have mounts um in our game at all sure that, re that reminds me i think someone asked this to the pantheon developers a couple months ago about uh in a more saga leucemia uh printed question and it's not really important but how long would you say it would take to walk from like the white hall to fingless mirror oh wow I don't, I don't really have a good answer to that. What I can say is that the current zone that we're using for stage three for this vertical slice um, is what we're hoping to be the gold standard that we use for all the zones in the future. Um, this is the biggest zone we've done today, and a lot of what stage three launch is about is about testing the optimization of that zone and seeing what it's going to be capable of handling in terms of you know how many people can we have logged in there and is performance going to hold up and so on and so forth. But if you walk and we're talking diagonally at this point but if you walk from one corner to the other it takes about an hour if you're if you're following the paths and you don't have any speed buffs or anything like that it's about an hour to to work your way if you're taking the paths up because again we have what we call our adric inhibitor which keeps you from like running up mountains and and cutting across the landscape so you literally have to go through the valleys and follow the terrain essentially um, and because you can't just jump up over the top of a hill and go as the crow flies, you have to treat it as if you were an explorer of that era who's on foot. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, but that's diagonal. If you talked about from one side to the other, probably 30 minutes, and assuming no combat. Like, And that's, again, that's if we're saying you're going from one side of the zone to the other in a straight line, which you can't do because of the way the terrain works. Sure. You're always going to be snaking around on things. So... The way the pathing works, for example, if you want to go from the starting village and go all the way down through Newby Valley, go up to the Y Bridge, go across the Y Bridge, go to the military encampment, and then follow the river back down as if you're going to Fingless Mirror, that probably takes around an hour. I don't know that I've actually tracked it, 
um, it takes around an hour, I think, um, because I've done like to, to the bridge section. And if you stop for some combat in there, it's a good 30 minutes, like to get out there to the bridge and cross the bridge. Um, so I think there's, I don't have the world map and I don't have the zone map in front of me, but I think there's two zone, like after you zone over, I think it goes to the metal lands and from the metal lands, you can go into whatever zone. I think it's two zones between white mist foothills and fingless mirror. So I think you'd probably be looking at, you know, a two hour journey. Maybe if you wanted to go from Whitehall to fingless mirror, maybe, um, you know, and that's that's just going to depend on a lot of factors. Like, I, so it's it's hard to know because we haven't actually tested like that component of it yet. So, but I would estimate, given the current zone side of the region, you'd be looking at about a two hour, two hour trek if you're doing it all on foot. Got to get some good shoes. Yep. Um. So <laughs> I have a quick little question. Why why is it called the Adric inhibitor? What does that mean? Because <laughs> Adric is one of our testers. Um, Adric lives. Yep. Who constantly was breaking things and going places he shouldn't be going. <laughs> um, so we just named it after him. Once we put in the, the basically it's just an inhibitor that it's a slope inhibitor. So the, the greater the slope, the slower your character moves. And eventually you'll get to a point where the slope is so steep that your character just can't go up at any. Yeah. Um, so that keeps players from running around. In the earliest stages of pre-alpha, it was actually just a stamina drain. So you would start running up a hill and your stamina would start running out and eventually you'd get to the point where you just couldn't climb anymore because you ran out of stamina. Mm -hmm. But then what you, all you'd have to do is sit and wait for 35 seconds or so until your stamina bar filled up again and then you could go a little bit more, wait, go a little bit more, wait, go a little bit more, and eventually you could get to the top and jump over and totally bypass all the content that was down there in the valley. So in order to get rid of that, we just put it in as a, as a slope inhibitor so you're required to actually um, you know, go around things as opposed to try to go over them. Yeah, we were playing with Adric in the most recent test, and I remember we were going to a place, and then he goes, wait, let me check this real quick. And he tried to walk up a mountain, and I was like, all right. <laughs> um, all right, so we got a question in the chat here. Humanoid says, are the masteries combinable in a way that gives you different variations in terms of roles like tank and healer? Yes. That's, the, that's just the short version. You can literally take any mastery that you want in the game. The masteries are just combinations of abilities, so... Um, you can literally combine all those different roles in whatever way you want to. So uh, uh, to give a better example of that, like in a traditional game, if you play a paladin, say, right, it's like a combination of a tank and a healer. So in our game, there are no paladins. But what you can do is you can take the knight stance, which gives you a, a shield in your offhand and allows you to use a one-handed weapon, which is a tank build. So you would have the, sh the, the knight mastery, so you sword and shield or mace and shield or whatever in shield. But then you could take the, the life magic mastery on the other for your other mastery at the start. So you'd be able to cast healing spells. Um, and then you could switch between those roles in combat. So, you know, you could be doing the tank stuff and then, oh, I need to heal myself. Let me switch over to my to my healing stance and now I can heal myself. Now I'm going to go back to my sword and shield and, and keep fighting in combat. So you can absolutely create the traditional roles that people are comfortable to when we talk about classes but you can also do whatever the hell you want because you can make up weird combinations <laughs> that might not make sense to any but this this is the thing we actually love about this is that it comes down to the player and player skill so you might come up with a build that's unique for you that no one else plays and that other people look at and go that's that's crazy like that's the worst build ever but it works for you because you like that combination of ability um, so Karth has a question as well. He says crowd mm -hmm. control was hugely important in EverQuest One, but seems less important in modern games. So will things like debuffs and mesmerize be important yes. in Saga? Um, utility. So there's this is a multifold answer. Um, you do not have hit point bloat in our game. So your characters start off right now, I believe, between 18 and 22 hit points, depending on how much constitution you have, and mobs can hit for seven, eight hit points so it's very easy when you get into a situation where you've got two or three mobs wailing on your tank and he's getting hit for like five points every time he's going to go down like that so it's very 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 important to control the amount of mobs that are attacking your tank and also to debuff everything 
to make sure that the mobs that are attacking your party are doing the least amount of damage as possible and to also debuff them against slashing and elemental damage and piercing damage and so on and so forth so that your party can be doing more damage to those mobs so our game the combat where it is in the current stage of alpha it may look very slow it may look turn-based to some people but there is a lot going on in terms of buffs debuffs mezes so on and so forth even with the state of alpha the way it is right now which is pretty early on because we only have about 20 masteries in the game right now each mastery currently only has three abilities long term each mastery line has in between 6 and 12 6 to 15 abilities in each mastery line so we're dealing with very basic skill sets right at the moment but even where we are at in stage 3 alpha right now crowd control and debuffs are hugely important to be able to survive in those group based encounters because you just don't have a lot of hit points and you have to control those encounters otherwise your tank's going to go down like that sure um well first of all i just want to say hi to everyone in the chat thanks for being yeah here. thanks everyone for your questions too um and thanks for asking questions um but in terms of um what you were just saying crowd control is majorly important in the most pr uh, recent test um we were playing with a almost full group i think we were at like seven in our group and then um we were in a place where there was a lot of enemies basically um and we were not having trouble keeping them you know at bay uh but then another group came along and they were a full group and then it was real easy so is that something that would be possible in terms of like if we went to a dungeon that was meant for one eight-man group mm -hmm. what if we went in with two eight-man groups what if we went in so with three eight-man groups the better question to that is why would you do that? So yeah, good question. If, if, if <laughs> to I make can make a funny YouTube if, video. <laughs> yeah, but let me let me let's expand upon that for a minute because because we don't have experience points mm -hmm. in our game. It's actually less beneficial for your group to kill things because you're only progressing your abilities through successful use. Sure. So the longer you know. Basically, if the mob goes down in two hits, no one in your party is getting any skill points. So yep. if you're mowing things down very quickly, no one's progressing their characters. Now, if we were doing a traditional game, like, say, World of Warcraft, where we had fetch quests, go kill ten of these. Go gather me five, five hides from the gnolls. Go gather me 20 wolf teeth or wolf tails or whatever. Then it would be beneficial Sure. to be killing things as quickly as possible because you're trying to get the drops or get the kills so that you can complete the quest to get back and get your experience points. We don't have experience points, and we don't have fetch quests. So there is no... The only reason I could see a group wanting to do that is if, for example, they had... Uh, like, everybody was on the last step of a major quest line and that required you to get to the boss at the end of the dungeon. And yeah. so you got your whole guild together and you just went in there and you just mowed everything down on the way down. You got to the end boss. Everybody gets their credit. And I'm okay with that. Like, if you've got the friends to make that happen and it's specifically about just getting the credit for that quest, that's great. But in terms of progressing your character, it doesn't... There's no benefit to doing it that way. Um, obviously, it's easier because you've got eight people and you're doing a camp that's meant for four or five people. Sure. But because there's no experience points and you're not doing any kill quests and you're not getting any updates from those things, there's not a lot of benefit to it because you're actually losing out on skill points and you're not actually getting any progression points from those yeah. encounters. Um, so that uh, makes... Well, so you said that there's never going to be a quest, like a, like a fetch quest, like get the wolf teeth or whatever. No. no? Um, so I think question... you know there may be there may be some there may be some components of the major quests where it's like we need I need the tooth of this mighty giant thrall sure. and you have to go hunt down the dragon thrall but he's a raid encounter you need two or three groups to take him down that's a lot different than go gather me ten wolf hides because it's literally you're not just it's not something that you can go out and do on your own it's actually something that requires multiple groups to do and it's a big boss encounter as opposed to these go get me 10 of these yeah. quests which i so hate. in regards to that then um as if you were in a party for example and you don't hit the enemy that big dragon thrall do you still get credit for it just because your party did it uh if you're in the group yeah because it's it's based yeah. on 
if the group tagged it, then that's how the credit works in our game. He who and, tags it, bags it. Okay, that's a good way to put it. Um, uh, and, and so if you're in a raid, is it like um, how WoW was where you would it would basically put um, all your parties into like one big raid group? And so therefore, uh, if any of the parties were to take down an enemy, everyone would get credit? Probably. I mean, we Something still haven't like fully designed the raid mechanics at that point, but that's probably the way it would work. Okay. Um, theoretically. Again, we haven't worked on raid mechanics yet in terms of how we're going to do the groups and stuff. So, Are works. mobs locked? Sorry, I, I saw this question pop up. I'm going to answer it quick. Are mobs locked once you hit it and tag it? No. So people can help you take down the mob. And they don't have to be in your party? Nope. Oh, thank God. That is the worst you can thing. Also, you can also buff people outside of your group. You can. We don't have a lot of buffs in the game right now. I think we have rock skin. That might actually be the only buff that's working right now is rock skin. Because we also have warding, but I don't think... Warding's not working at the moment because it's meant to be a rune ward, so it's a damage ward. Um, but we don't actually have the back end working on that. So it's literally just a skill that goes off, but it doesn't actually do anything. But I think, I think rock skin is the only buff that's actually working at the moment. Um... And that just reminded me of a question I wanted to ask earlier. Um, are you going to have world bosses? Yes. You're, you're talking like like things that wander the zones yeah. that are open to contestant. Yes. Um, like, so uh, we actually what have was that guy's name in World of Warcraft. They pulled him to uh, that city that one time and they killed everyone. <laughs> what was his name? In vanilla. I don't know. I don't. I don't know enough about World of Warcraft because uh, I was an EverQuest guy, so I don't really know. Oh uh, well. Uh, is uh, that's another question as well, but you can go ahead and say what you were gonna say first. Yeah, so there's there's world bosses which are open for contests and you know for the people who want to participate in in contested mobs, but they're not they're not about quests. They're not related to quests or anything. So they're just there for people to participate in. Some of those may be what we call our hunters and seekers, and our hunters and seekers are mobs or groups of mobs that actively seek out players in a zone. So. They're there to keep everybody on their toes at all times. So if you think of EverQuest 1, the griffin that runs in the hill giant in common lands, but they were on set paths, so it was very easy to avoid those if you knew the paths and people would shout, hey, the griffin's up, just and you would avoid where the griffin was going to run. Ours are different because they, they patrol the entire zone and they look for players. So you can't avoid them. Um, they're going to be coming after everybody at some point. And so you really have to keep your eyes open for these hunters and seekers. And some of these are going to be things that a single group could take on. Others are going to be things that require a, the, the community of the zone coming together to kill that mob so that everyone's safe for the next two hours or three hours or however long it takes him to respawn. Um, so yes, there are world bosses, but there are also the hunters and seekers and sometimes they can be both. So how do the hunters and seekers decide like what they're going after? Because you said they go after players. Yeah, I can't. I I'm not going to get into the programming side of that just because that's technical stuff. Sure. Um, but it's um, the easiest way to explain it is just they look for players. Okay. And seek them out. Um, because there's a whole bunch of technical stuff that I, yeah, we shouldn't talk about. <laughs> um, that's it. That's NDA stuff. All right. And um, is is there ever going to be um? Because I know there's no PVP right um but could a hunter and seeker perhaps like attack a, a, an npc and make it you know so that you would have a reason to go defend them in in the town um, for example repeat the question can can a hunter seeker is that what you asked can a hunter seeker yeah would attack? a hunter seeker ever pursue like an npc possibly um because we've already kind of got like wolves will attack deer um yeah because that's what they would do. Um, I would say that more than likely, so this goes back to the ring and shawl quests in EverQuest, which you guys may not have ever done, but they were part of the Velace expansion. And one part of the, that quest line was you would eventually have to defend the city of Thurgadden against the giants. And the giants would spawn in these waves of mobs and they would start attacking the dwarf and the dwarven NPCs. And you had to defend them or they would overrun the city. Mm -hmm. um, so I can absolutely see that kind of content taking place. Cause, yeah, I like the idea of like protecting a city from something. Like that sounds like fun to me. So I was just wondering if that would be a feature. Um, so we got a question here in the chat from Django Unchanged Seven. He says, "Are there rare spawn mobs?" Yes. Um, like naming mobs, for example. Yes. 
Um, it's a lot different than other games, though, because we're doing things. Everything's dynamic spawns. So nothing ever saw, nothing ever spawns in the same place twice. Um, um, yeah, there's a lot more to it than that. But yes, the short answer is that yes, there are named mobs and rare mobs. Okay. Um, Carl asked a question that we forgot. Today. Okay. He says, uh, "How about player and enemy collision? Can you walk through enemies and players? Can uh, can you block enemies by standing standing in a choke choke point or will they phase through?" I believe the way it's working at the moment is um, there is no player collision, so you can run through each other. Um, I th think, and I'm off the top of my head, this is because I don't have Bobby here to answer this technical question, but I think the way it works right now is there is enemy collision, so you can do things. They don't just phase through a rock or a wall. Mm -hmm. um, they have to go around a, a, a wall or something. And if there's a limited space, I think you can do choke points, which is part of like the strategic element. Um, there's also another aspect of this, which we were just talking about, I think, yesterday in Discord, which is because of the way our inhibitor works when you're running up slopes, it's actually a very bad idea because to, to, to have a camp up on a slope and then pull back to that camp, which is what you would do in traditionally in EverQuest 1, like if you were in the overland somewhere, um, you would... Okay, Bobby's actually answering me real quick. And he says, enemies do not collide with one... Thank you for updating me on that, Bobby, because I didn't remember. <laughs> um, so that should answer your question. There is no enemy collision. I knew about no player collision. I wasn't sure about the enemy. Is there ever going to be plans for that, or is that the way it's going to be players, forever? Players do not collide with enemies either. You know, I... That's one of those things we'll just have to see how oh, we yeah. go throughout the course of development. Okay. Um, what were we? There was something else we were talking about a second ago too that I got sidetracked on. With the name mobs. No. No. It's all good. We'll keep going. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions? Um, I guess this kind of got me thinking. And Doctor and asked it in our Discord, even though I know he just left. If he'll hear it later. Um, you said you'd be adding new dungeons. Would you be adding? Uh, new masteries and maybe even new races once yes. we have all the planned ones out? Yes. I mean, that's already up on our website. Like, we talk about that. We've been talking about that for, like, five years. Like, sure. volume two, we bring the other races into the... Thank you, Brojan. I'll get back to that in a second. Thank you for reminding me. Um, volume two is when we bring the other races into the picture. Um, and we'll be adding more masteries throughout after volume one launches. And also, when we get to volume two, there will be the adept skills that come into play with magic finally coming usable as opposed to just these items so yes that will be a work in progress and to get back to what i was talking about with the the hill strategy thing um because of the way the inhibitor works with running up slopes and stuff it actually in a traditional game like in everquest if you if you were to go to like to the over there in kunark days like the whole strategy was all the groups would set up their camps on the wall and the wall was like this incline and you would put your camp all the way at the top of that wall and you would send your ranger out or your monk out and they would pull mobs back to the camp they would pull them up the slope but you would get out of the aggro range or everything else you actually can't really do that in our game because you're you're going so much slower as you're moving up slopes um that it, the terrain is another aspect of planning your strategy for encounters like using the terrain to your advantage um, because things move up s hills more slowly okay um and you just mentioned aggro range. Does that exist in this game? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, mobs can hear you. They can see you. They can smell you. And there are other senses that we will be adding later on, which is why invisibility is never going to be a safe bet because just because you're invisible to the site doesn't mean that you can't be heard or sensed or <laughs> smelled through other senses like infrared, infravision, heat signatures, blood smell, so on and so forth. That's interesting. I tried running from a bear who Yeah, good hurt luck me. with the bears. <laughs> bears are really, really, really mean in yeah. the woods right now. Which we is funny because I actually my wife actually um wa rewatched The Revenant last night with Leonardo DiCaprio and I've always used that bear scene whenever people tell me I should be able to solo mobs in the forest and I'm like, Go watch the Revenant and come back to me and tell me about how you should be able to yeah. solo a bear <laughs> with a spear spear or a sword like he had a gun and still almost died like you and know it took him what a few hours <laughs> yeah it was it, you know if you're out there with primitive medieval weapons like a bear is an animal to be feared of course and should not be taken lightly um 
on that mark, so will there be like a like halberds and spears? I saw someone ask it on the forum. Yes. I don't know if those answered. Will There's that... actually um, only the guards have halberds at the moment. Let me double check because I know we just put something in last night or this morning. I don't know yeah, if we... Yeah, we saw a guard with one. Yeah, yeah the guards have them. Will that, in like, will that increase range? Oh, yeah. Attacks? Would you be able to hit further away? A bardish. Um, yeah, I mean, weapon, the hitboxes and stuff, you know, there is a range to weapon of that nature. So we'll be addressing that. Um, I, I don't know how exactly that's going to work quite yet, so I can't exactly answer that question. But, like, you know, bows and crossbows have different ranges um, sure. because they're different types of weapons, so on and so forth. Magical spells have different ranges than other things so range is important so okay and uh i was just thinking about how you said we're not going to have mounts um so in world of warcraft at least these days i don't know about back in the day uh and even in final fantasy 14 for example um bosses usually in those two games will have very rare drops like the rarest drop usually is a mount right are there going to be any, like, super, super rare drops um, to replace that kind of idea? Like, a, like a, for example, a Ragnaros in WoW, you would get that, I can't remember what it's called, the Heart of Ragnaros or something, and you could use that to make his hammer sulfurous, and it would be a yes. huge long Oh, no, there's change. definitely, yeah, that's part of our epic crafting system, which is, okay. yes, that's the short answer to that question is, yeah. there are things that are, you, there are craftable items in the game that will require super rare components that are only achieved, that are only attained through raids and or at the end of the biggest dungeons in the game. Okay. Um, That's a good question, actually. Bardish. Is that how you pronounce that, Theater Elf? Bardish? That's how I pronounce it. I don't know if that's, that's right. That's how I would pronounce it. So we actually just added that in um, as a craftable recipe. So oh, cool. actually, So the, previously the guards have only ever had it, but we're actually for... Part of the early stages of crafting players can actually go out there and craft that now so geofrey asked a good question i've when, we've been playing everquest 2 recently and we'll see high level players doing these really cool spells and they have like awesome animations and stuff but he says uh, it was stated that there's no vfx artist or animations person yet so how high on the totem pole is it to make those animations look cool and fluid and impactful the number yeah so we have a variety of positions we're hiring for right now and it's all high on the total pull art lead animator vfx person graphics programmer um all of those are high on our our totem pull um i've got the vfx working decently for uh stage three so they're at a very basic kind of everquest one level um but the objective is yes to bring on somebody who's going to be working on making that look um better over time now i will say that we're not going to be going so i'll expand on this a little bit more we're not going to be doing a triple a style of vfx so when i say that i mean let's take a look at final fantasy 14 let's take a look at elder scrolls online let's take a look at what they're doing with chronicles or not chronicles they're gone now uh ashes <laughs> of creation um these games if you watch them there are so many spell effects going off on the screen that you just can't tell what's going on and we're not doing that we're definitely going back to the early world of warcraft and the kind of everquest or early everquest 2 style where your starter abilities have very simple effects as you become more powerful and as you gain more abilities in those mastery lines the effects will get progressively more um visually impressive so that they it, you get the sense that I'm progressing from a, a level one mage to you know, I'm level one fire mastery. Now I'm level 60 in fire mastery. Now I'm level 100 in fire mastery. The VFX will change depending on the, the type of abilities that you're using within a given line. But we're never going to be going with that over the top, um, just like 75 VFX going off on your screen at one time and you just can't yeah. see what's going on. Like yeah, that, that kind of crap. I hate it. That's too much. Yeah, in Final Fantasy XIV, there used to be this spell that bards could do where you'd shoot these air one arrow in the air, and literally like 400 arrows would come down. And which, it's like, which, I which can't game? see my party members. Which game did you say? Final Fantasy XIV. Yeah, I think I remember that. See, also they did that with like, um, yeah, I can, uh, in Elder Scrolls Online, you do that too. You can shoot up in the air, and then just a rain of arrows comes down. 
and it's just like yeah it obliterates everything you can't see anything it's yeah just as too a healer it's hard point. to click players who need help <laughs> yeah so um, we're definitely keeping it simple as simple as possible but still maintaining a visual impact sure um so django unchained asked a question which rich here tried to answer a little bit but let's see what you have to say he said will there be armor sets and if so is there going to be a bonus for having the full set yes um there are relics there will be relic sets from the dungeons and raids that you can get that have set bonuses you know it'll be a full set of like seven pieces or something and as you get the sets they'll have bonuses but um the crafted sets and stuff probably not i think they'll just have basic stats and and uh, resists and things of that nature um so um, but yeah from dungeons and raids and doing quests yes i had a question on crafting um so you can go to the store and let's say buy like your chain mail or whatever but what if a player crafted chain mail would there be a uh, that, that's where we get into like the base stuff that you're going to find in the in the wilds or what you can buy off of the merchant is just going to be it's going to be armor class and that's it mm -hmm. now if you want armor that gives you resists or it's lighter or harder and more durable or all these different things then you're going to need to look to crafters because that's where the materials and the properties of the materials come into play so we, we were talking about this the other day on the stream as an example like let's say i want to craft a leather set of armor now there's just there's a recipe for the tier one leather set so there you have like whatever seven things that you can make in the tier one set depending on what type of leather you use depending on that that changes the end results so bunny rabbit fur versus bear bear skins versus deer skins versus you know turtle skins versus whatever all of those different hides have different properties which impact the end results of that tier one set so it's going to be about well what do i want for my character what defines what complements my type of play style and then you're going to want to find hides which have the properties that match the style of gameplay that you're choosing for your character and then when someone goes to make that set for you it will have bonuses associated with the properties of those materials okay that's that that's nice because i feel like um in th a game like runescape which i played a lot when i was younger there's just besides getting your level and your crafting skills there's no real um reason to craft most stuff. games there's not <laughs> and we're trying really hard to make sure that crafting is important for people in this game cool it's pretty important in like lord of the rings online um, in terms of being able to do content. Um, so yeah, that's great. Um, that was a good question coming from Elf, I think. She said, or they said, rather. Um, uh, would you be able to, is there going to be a system like transmogrifying, for example, or so no outfit system whatsoever? At this moment, no. Um, we have something in the back of our minds that we may be putting in to the game and it's going to be for players who have so this is a difficult question for me to answer let me let me first say this in our world and and i'm a person who has in streams and in public said i absolutely love and i've spent tons of money in star wars Old Republic and lord of the rings online making my character look really like how i want them to look yeah however we're very much going back to the old system of you should look like what you earned sure. in the game we want there to be that level of you walk into town and people can look at you and go, I know exactly like he did that. Yeah. Because it gives it gives other players something to aspire to. That being said, um, we are kind of in the back of our minds understanding that the modern generation of players, which includes me, I like to be able to customize my characters. So we have to try to find a balance in there of keeping true to the system of you look like what you earned while also allowing players to um, perhaps uh, modify their look. But, you know, without getting into the details, they would need to have done the content first, sure. earned the items first, so on and so forth. But it's not set in stone. Um, there definitely won't be any sort of, like, the ability to just on the fly, just because I want to give myself all black armor. Like, that's not going to be a possibility. Sure. Like, you're going to have there, – there will be – do checks something. and balances in place to make sure that you're earning the right to change the way your character looks uh dies i don't think we're going to include those it's it's 
we've talked about it. I, it's not something that we're considering at the moment because that uh, that's we'll see. It's a step in the direction of suddenly I can look how like I want to look as opposed to looking like how I earned, you know, looking like what I earned. So yeah, it's a it's a tricky balance that we're we're going to be working with the community over the next couple of years as we work towards launch. We're going to be working with the community to figure out a good solution to that. That's a you know a, a compromise. So that that sounds like there's a no microtransactions either. No. <laughs> yeah, because I was just yesterday on EverQuest 2, I bought some robes off the marketplace, and they were pink. And so I just got my Daybreak cash for the month, and I look yep. cool now, you know? <laughs> yeah, got your Daybreak cash, bought your 20 dye, black dyes, and dyed it black, or whatever color you want. Yep. Like, it's, yeah, it's, I understand the convenience, and I understand why people like it. I love that system as well, but it's just not, yeah. However we end up doing it, it's going to be something that requires players to put in time and effort. Sure. Um, and the priority is always going to be looking like what you earned because we want players around you to look at you and go, oh, he did that content or she did that zone or they did that dungeon. I want to do that because that looks really cool and that gives you something to want to go do and a reason to get together with friends and to go do that content. Um, that also reminds me. So in like um, World of Warcraft, back in the day, you would grind the dungeons to get all these mats and then you could make the dungeon gear. And it looked really, it looked good. It was a full set. I would say, without getting into too many details, that's definitely a system we've looked at and kind of said, hmm, that's maybe something that could work because it requires you to put in the time mm -hmm. and the effort to get it. It's not just something where you can buy it from a cash shop and have it. So without divulging any details, I can say that that is a system we have looked at and went, hmm. Okay. Um, so this was a, I feel like this question will be quick, so I'll ask it. Uh, is there, Karth says, is there an in-game map for the Overland or Dungeons? Is there an in-game map? No. Yeah. Yep. Nope. The only map that exists is the world map that you can download off the website. And the ones that I draw in my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, Carmageddon has more of a suggestion here than a question. He says, what if a specific crafting skill would be able to alter appearances of gear for people? And... Elf kind of elaborated on that by saying, like, a tailor could make a pink version of the outfit or a, or a black version or whatever. I don't think that's something that we would allow because that crosses into that whole territory of being able to dye your armor sure. or of that nature. So I don't think that's something we're going to consider. Again, work in progress and stuff, but, uh, yeah, it's um, it's one of those things where we really want people to focus on earning their gear. Um, and if you can just make it look like how you want to use it, make it look like how you want it to look with a crafter we've defeated that purpose Karth says that some of his favorite memorable moments in EverQuest were getting lost so getting he's lost. happy that there's no map so we were actually talking about this somewhere the other day like um, someone was complaining about the lack of a mini map and we were talking about how I, I to this day all the content up to like Planes of Power in EverQuest 1 there's like five expansions so you know multiple years of all that stuff is just ingrained in my memory because sure. we had to learn those zones from scratch. There was no mini map to get around. And so you just learned how to navigate those zones. Um, and that's something that just sticks with you. Oh yeah. Tony says, um, when everyone eventually gets the best or the same and the best in slot armor for people, uh, everyone's going to look the same. So I would debate that because yes, in our game there is no best in slot first and foremost there's no there is no best in slot because this is not a class-based game so it's classless it's just based on abilities so what's best in slot for you is not necessarily going to be best in slot for all the let, let, let me use this as an example let's say you're a tank and you like to tank with a shield and you have this thing that you're wearing like a shield that you have that you consider to be the best shield in slot because it matches your selection of masteries and your selection of skills but not every single tank in the game is going to be using the same combination of masteries now i'm sure some players they exist they're always going to exist the min maxers are going to come in and they're going to try to define what is best mastery combination for a shield tank what is the best mastery combination for a spirit mage? Best mastery combination for whatever. If you choose to play by those rules, that is you, you alone. 
sure. decision. We're not the ones defining that. That's the player base that's defining. It. So I, I find the whole concept of best in slot to be a little kind of bullshit because even using World of Warcraft as, as an example, having just played through Classic, we were doing things without best in slot items that everyone else would was demanding that you have best in slot items to do. And it's like, you don't need best in slot items to do that content. That's just something that people choose to define for themselves. Yeah, and the other need, way to answer... You need best yeah, the in other slot way so you can be at the too. top of the damage meters. <laughs> right, and the other way to look at that too is that um, game, our, our items, they're very difficult to obtain because of the nature of the game. And there's... Um, there, there is no RNG in the sense that we don't have RNG stats and things on items, so all of the gear is designed by us specifically. Like, all the drops for boss mobs are handcrafted, hand-designed. Um, and a mob might have 10 or 20 things that he drops, um, and they're going to have a certain rarity attached to them, so they will be very, very difficult. Again, go back to EverQuest 1. Um, eventually... Over time, the FBSS became something that everybody had. But for the first couple of years, getting the FBSS was this thing of rarity. And if you were one of the lucky people who's able to get that camp and sit there for hours on end and actually get the drop, you became one of the you know 1% or 2% on the server who actually had that item. Um, so that's, yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not too concerned with that at all. Yeah, I, it, it. Yeah, like a lot of people in World of Warcraft, for example, have the uh, Thunder Fury, right? But you know, the people who had it in two thousand five, they were a big deal. Not so. I'll, you know, I'll even take that a bit further because I didn't play a lot of World of Warcraft, mostly with EverQuest two. Um, our guild, when we were at the top of the food chain, never once did any of us ever worry about best in slot items. Sure. We just went. We literally just went and did the content, and we got what we got. Get and what we you get, you don't throw a fit. And we were like literally the top one to three server, depending on the given week. We were sure. top ten wide between slot four and slot seven. And at no point in time did we ever focus on best in slot. We just went out and did the content and yeah. had fun as a group. You got to get the content done, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you choose to focus on best in slot, personal thing, not a, yeah. not a design thing. Which, like I said earlier, to me, the only reason to have best in slot is to make sure you're at the very top of the damage meters. Are there going to be any, or is there going to be anything like that in Saga Lucina? No. I'm sure people will create their own versions of, like, you know, they're going to have a parser that they're trying to run to sure. determine. But we're heavily against add ons. Uh, we're not going to, I mean, we're going to actively be hunting people down who are trying to use add ons. So you will be banned if you do that. Yeah, that's that's my take on it right now. Um, I don't approve of add-ons. Sure. Um, especially the worst to me is the the aggro meter, the threat meter. Sure. Um, if you're if you can't learn how to play with your other group mates, <laughs> and the only way you can do it is through a threat meter, then you're not a good player. Is the way I've always viewed sure. it. Like it takes it takes skill to know when to back off the DPS and when to go full bore. It takes skill to coordinate a group of, you know. 25 people 30 people to come together to do the content to know when you should go all out when you should back away when you should run in when you should get away from the aoe that's player skill and if you're relying on a bunch of flashing add-ons and things it takes the player skill out of the equation so sure. we don't want that we want player skill to be front and center so we're not yeah add-ons are not on our list of approved you need a raid leader to scream at people that's what we yeah need. we don't need a <laughs> dkp <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> all right so karth says you mentioned that there's a mechanic for going up and down hills. Is the Z-axis a big feature in the world? It will be. It's not at the moment. Um, it will be, eventually. Um, so... I have a question real quick. Um, we have a just quick... Just a oh. simple one. Um, but uh, will there be, like, a dungeon finder? No. There's a looking for group finder. So there's no matchmaking system is the better way to answer that question. There's no matchmaker in our game. There is. We're working on a looking for group panel. It's not in the game right now um, because we don't need it at the moment because we're not dealing with you know tens of thousands of players in alpha. Um, but when we get to that point where we need it, we'll be implementing. It's very much like I think it's in Final Fantasy XIV. Also, I think World of Warcraft maybe even has a version and definitely in EverQuest 2. You have a looking for group panel where you can bring it up. You can put yourself in there as looking for a group because you're this role you can put what kind of content you're looking for or what quest you're on yeah. um and then if you're a group you can look for other players that way and then 
people can look at that panel and then send tells to each other and negotiate the terms of their group and transportation. Yeah, I'll tell you from my experience that Final Fantasy XIV's looking for group system is actually really good. Um, I haven't tried EverQuest twos, but I really like Final Fantasy XIV. It helps with grinding out levels and stuff at when you have to do that. Um, we have a question from our Discord actually, um, from our friend Gunter. He plays EverQuest one and two, but he plays in first person. And so he wants mm-hmm. to know if there's going to be changeable perspectives within yes. Saga of Lucemia. Yes, we actually, um, a couple years ago, we had both. We started off only with first person because we weren't dealing with third person camera. Then we went to the both. And then when we redid the back end for stage through stage two, we just haven't ever added the first person camera back in. But it will be coming back in sometime in stage three. That first person camera will be coming back in and you'll be able to choose between third person or first person. Okay. Which, we were talking to Gunter about this the other day, actually, that begs the question. In EverQuest 1, the only way swimming works is in first person. <laughs> is that not going to be a problem? <laughs> Things like that, where you have to do it this way, oh, or wow. it won't have work? I guess I hadn't remembered that, that you could only swim in... Is that true? Like, I haven't so, played EverQuest like, in so long. Here's how I figured that out. In Crushbone, right when you walk into the door of the castle, or the whatever it is... Um, there's a pool of blood just right by the door and I didn't see it so I walked into it I spent like 20 minutes trying to just get out first thing I or then at some point I went to first person I looked up and I just walked out oh I see what you mean so technically because technically in, in EverQuest 1 you could swim in third person mm-hmm. the issue becomes it's not just there it's also the, the fountain in um, um, where is it in, in uh, Kaladim when you're running in and you're going over to the Warriors Guild, um, there's a fountain right there. And if I've, I've fallen into that fountain so many times over the years. Um, <laughs> and if you fall in that fountain, it is very difficult um, to get out unless you go into first person and pan your camera up yeah. and look out. But that's, that's more of a, uh, as far as I understand it, that's more of a nav mesh issue um, with just how he's interacting with your characters interacting with the world sure. as opposed to it's not that you're forced to swim in first person it's just that the easiest way to certain, do it. it's the easiest way to get out because you can totally get out in third person but it's a pain in the butt yeah all right well that means we got professionals on saga of leucemia none yeah, of we that hope. shit <laughs> <laughs> um so uh django and shane wants to know that if there are diminishing returns I don't think not at any. the moment on anything. We've talked about some things that potentially might have diminishing returns, but not at the moment. So if you were to sit there camping the same thing for 30 hours, let's just say, something ridiculous, well, would, it, would there be a, uh, any yeah, so consequences? Yes, there, there are. No, they're not consequences, but to put it into perspective, you know, in EverQuest, as an example, you had levels. And so when you first started attacking something it might be a white con or yellow con so it's even or slightly better than you and then once you get beyond it it goes blue and then it goes to low green or light green or is it wait it's blue dark blue light blue light green and then gray i don't remember the exact tiers but eventually you would get to the point you went from the point where it was red and you couldn't you couldn't land any attacks on it and then it was gray and you no longer got experience points Mm. from it so we have something that's similar, even though we don't have levels. The mobs have difficulty ranges. Sure. And if you're if you're within this range, then you will get progression points for your abilities from attacking those mobs. But if it's beyond the upper point, you'll never land anything, and everything's based on successful use of abilities. So if it's too difficult for you, you'll never be able to land attacks on it, therefore you'll never get any skill up points. And if you're too far beyond it, again, the same thing happens. You'll stop getting progression points from it so in that sense yes the progression of abilities do have diminishing returns your reputation might diminish too (laughs) well there's factions so yeah so there will be like um rep grinding yeah we don't have we don't have factions in at the moment but yeah faction is a is going to be a pretty big part of things faction will be required for uh, quests faction will be required for getting access to recipes for crafting. Okay. It'll be required for getting access to zones. Um, uh, additional masteries and abilities will be locked behind faction right. quests. So I, I think I already said quests. Lots of stuff is going to be behind faction. Yeah. Um, interesting. So yeah, we were talking about EverQuest 2's housing and how it's the best housing ever in anything ever. How is Saga of Lucemia going to compete 
<laughs> uh, we're not going to have it in launch, so, you know, I, I, all I can say is that we're looking at some sort of thing between, like, EverQuest 2, Star Wars Galaxies, and the Vanguard housing systems. Uh, we're dude, looking at Star all Wars Galaxies was amazing. Yes, we're, that's probably our number one pick. Yeah. But it's an engineering thing that's going to take us a very long time, so it's not going to be in for launch. It's going to be a long project for us. If we get it in by Volume 2, I would think that would be a very cool thing to have for Volume 2 when it launches. But it's a huge engineering feat, and it's gonna it's gonna require a lot of time and effort. So that's the the best answer I can give on it because we don't sure. have a lot defined there. I want to be the mayor and collect my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so is there? I I think we could start getting into maybe some lore questions because I know Liam's dying to ask some. <laughs> um, is there any like? I don't know exactly how to ask this question. Um. Is there like a chief deity for the for the world that an NPC might? No, have? I specifically did not put gods in, um, because I didn't want to focus on. There's two things that I didn't want to do when I was working on the book for the very beginning. I said I don't want there. I don't want any prophecy bullshit, <laughs> and I don't want any sort of, like, I don't want there to be. Because if you look at like Dragonlance is a good example. There were definitely deities and they were involved in the. Um, that was a whole key aspect of Dragonlance and a lot of other worlds have done that but i wanted to keep deities out of it so there are mention like some of the characters in the in the book have they'll 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 mention something and it's more about like that's their personal belief like a personal deity or something but it's not like an official deity of the world so i've kind of left it open to interpretation for the readers in the sense that there's no actual official deities of any kind now that may change as I continue to flesh out the series. But for the most part, I want to keep it kind of, it's more about people in this world understand the elemental nature of the world. And so they're focused on the elements as opposed to some magical pie man in the sky. Sure. Um, there was actually one more question we had about the game before we got onto lore that I forgot yep. to ask. Um, into, uh, for banking and like auction house type stuff how's that gonna work uh the easiest answer i can give you right now is it's gonna be regional in nature so there's not gonna be a global auction house um there will be regional banks which are right at, i think they're set to three regions like now which is gonna be like whitehall fingless mirror and foreign mirror so each, each there'll be like four zones four or five zones around any given city and that's gonna be the region that you're in and those will all be linked um but once you get out of that region if you've got stuff in that bank or if there's stuff in that auction hall, it's probably going to function a lot like how EverQuest 2 did in the sense that, um, you know, if you're in another region, you'll have options, but one option is to go to the, go back to the region where that thing is for sale um, and buy it directly. Um, you might be able to have it shipped to you, but it would cost a huge in-game fee. So we would kind of want to inspire people to either go back and get it or rely on other people to do caravans and bring things to you sure. um uh, getting things oh. shipped to you magically would be something that That's we would scary. prefer to keep to a minimum so there would be some sort of if we did it that way there'd be some sort of a hefty fee um with that being said that just reminded me of another question um is there going to be, in World of Warcraft, there's Griffin Riders, you know, in EverQuest, there's yeah. many things, nothing like that. I don't, I don't think so. We've, we've toyed around with the idea, you know, like, they had boats in EverQuest 1, they also had boats in World of Warcraft Classic and in Vanilla that would take you from one continent to another, but we're not dealing with continents in our game. It's a single continent right sure. now. So, um, there will be some, you know, we're looking at, like, Druid Rings, Wizard Portal type things, like whatever Quest 1 had, combined with, like, some Portal Stones from World of Warcraft, where... You know, if you've gone there and you've already explored it and you've got a few people together who are there, they can potentially summon someone else um, to that location using some sort of reagents and costs. Sure. Um, but I don't anticipate any sort of like way of, of like fast travel mounts or anything like else where you could like EverQuest 2 has the Griffins, World of Warcraft has the griffins everquest 2 even had horses in some of the zones yeah. where you could just get on a horse and ride to the other side of the zone I, yeah i don't think we're gonna have those types Lord of the rings things. has it online where you can that's ride true the horse they also have the horses swift yeah. travel teleport on a horse yeah <laughs> all right yeah okay so that's that's like 
I guess um, for in terms of uh, monsters that are going to be in the game, is it just like your standard fantasy type monsters, dragons, things like that? Yeah, it's mostly high. Anything you've seen in high fantasy or Dungeons and Dragons, you're going to be most of the stuff that we're going to have in our oh, game. That's one of those things where it's like if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, you know, the difference is that our playable races. I'm not doing your traditional dwarves, hobbits, elves, half elves, that kind of stuff. Um, the dwarhe are like rock elementals, stone elementals, earth elementals kind of thing. Um, somebody brought it up to me, which I had no idea about the World of Warcraft lore until I played Classic recently. And I guess the lore of World of Warcraft is before dwarves were dwarves, which is the curse of the flesh, they were actually earth elementals. And I was like, well, that's essentially what the dwarves are. They're earth elementals, but they were inspired by dwarves. So knowing that lore from World of Warcraft, it's like, well, that's a reference point that I can use, even though I had no idea when I was actually sure. creating those guys, because I did that 20 years ago, you know, before World of Warcraft was ever around. Um, and then my Ellen High and Elden I are essentially kind of like um, High Elves. It's like hybrid High Elf, Wood Elves, and a hybrid of Wood Elves and Dark Elves. It's a weird kind of thing. I was more inspired by the Elves from Tad Williams' uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn series than any other fantasy series. So the you know our playable races are quite different than what you're going to see in most traditional other fantasy games. But the NPCs and the monsters of the world, those are going to be far more traditional, um, you know, minotaurs and hill giants and dragons and things of that nature. Dude. Hill giants. <laughs> hill giants are a lot of... And hill giants, frost giants and fire giants are the worst in, like, traditional, like, AD&D. Like, yeah. uh, you know, advanced dozens of dragons. You do not want to screw with fire giants and ice giants. They're fun to farm on EverQuest 1, though. Yes, they are. <laughs> Um, okay. So, yeah, what is the time frame on the release of the game as of right now? Uh, our target window is Q4 2021. So the end of next year is the target window. But I always like to remind people that that could slide three to six months. Either direction? <laughs> Either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's potentially possible, but more than likely. More likely the other way. Other direction. <laughs> yeah, sure. Some um, of that just depends on when we hire people because we're actively looking and the quicker we get people hired, the quicker we can make progress on things. Sure. And um, what about going into beta? It's tentatively scheduled for next summer. But again, that's a sliding, <clears throat> excuse me, a sliding window. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how much it actually matters. But, <laughs> um, but I know you. there's been like, um, you can kind of guess on like a timeline when like the like, Great War ended and when the Island Wars were about 25 years before. Is there a, like a calendar system in place now? I haven't put anything in place, no. I've just, it's literally, it's in the book. So if you've read the book, you can get a rough timeline. And I'm going to tell you something that no author should ever say. I don't ever remember the timelines and I have to go back and look at the book. So at some point, I'm going to actually have to do that and actually because I remember, oh, I think it was like 25 or was it 27 or was it 32? And I have to literally go back and look it up in the book and go, okay, it was 25 years ago. <laughs> like, so that kind of stuff, eventually I'll just need to start putting it down, you know, in a timeline. You can get but that there's official Lord of the Rings that. timeline fan made thing on the yep. internet. Maybe we could, maybe Hemvar could do something like that for you. <laughs> Message him on Discord. <laughs> um, uh, that's, I mean, I don't really have any more questions. But I want to say something to the chat real quick. We are going to be doing an in-game stream with uh, Renfail here. and uh, I think assume... it's next week, isn't it? Yeah, it's exactly a week from now. Let me um, look at the calendar. Next Tuesday. So, if you are here right now and you're enjoying this and if the game looks interesting to you, you should join us for that. Um, and you should pop a follow just to make sure that you get a notification when we go live for that. Yeah, um, did we set a time for that? I like think noon. we did. I don't remember what it was. Uh, on my calendar, it shows, two p it shows 2 p.m. Central on my time. So I think it's noon your time. That sounds right. I think it was something like that. I don't yeah, remember. Noon or one or something yeah. Time. Um, I don't think I'll be doing any more streams for the future because I've already done more than enough. And I don't want to spoil things for people. So the servers kick off um, at noon on Friday. And we're just going to let people go enjoy. And then you guys will stream with you guys next Tuesday. And then we're going to be streaming with people. I would like to remind everybody, too, um, for those of you who are following along, who are here for the first time, or they're supporters of these two guys, um, 
they do have an affiliate link down somewhere i think in their discord um if you do decide that you like the game that we're building and you think that you would like to join stage three and participate in what we're doing use their link don't just go to the website and buy it on your own it would be much better if you use their affiliate link that way you guys can directly support them and their channel because um, these guys are part of our new content creation affiliate program that we've set up so we're going to be doing streams with all of our content creators over the next few months and that's the way that you guys can help support them because they get a kickback on any sales that go through with their affiliate link Very honored. and we'll play with you <laughs> yeah and all the streams all the streams that they're going to be doing these are live guided streams so myself and probably Ella will be here for those. Um, the Q and A's aren't so important that she's here, but when we do the actual playthroughs, um, traditionally she's gonna be there for all the playthroughs so that she can be answering questions and checking chat and everything while we're running the groups and stuff, so. Did you have any questions? Oh, thank you very much, Theater Elf. I don't know why the noise goes off so many times. Poor Ella and those late, late nights. Yeah, she's adjusted yeah. her schedule for this, so kudos to her, it is. Well, these aren't too bad because if we're doing a stream right now, at this time it's like nine or ten o'clock at night for her, so it's not too bad. It's the ones that we do at like, <clears throat> excuse me, at like eight o'clock evening central time when she's up at like three o'clock in the morning. So yeah, that's pretty brutal for her. Um, Ouch. We kind of actually tried to think about that. When we yeah, we, we decided we would do it early, or you know, hopefully. Oh, it's all good. Time for everybody's us. everybody's got different schedules and. Like we've got content creators now from the U.S. and the European Union, so we're going to be doing a little bit of a split. Some people will be doing it in the afternoons, like you guys, and we've got other people who are doing it at nighttime. So it's going to be for me. It, it's easy because I'm either going to be doing it in the afternoons or the evening, um, sure. and we're going to be trying to make it convenient for everybody all around. So that'll be a work in progress to make sure we get all the schedules worked out. So any final up, follow up questions, or is that a wrap? I think that's everything that we've got for now. I mean. I'm sure we'll have more to ask you in the future, but for this stream, sure. I think that's everything. <laughs> All right. Well, it was a pleasure to be on. Thanks to everybody who was here for the first time. I know some of you were coming over from our existing Discord channel, and you've heard me talk about this stuff before, but everyone who was new and had never uh, seen me or heard me before, um, as these guys are kicking off their Twitch channel, don't forget, like I said, give them a follow. Stick around. I know they're playing EverQuest 2 right now, and they're EverQuest 2 virgins. So yes, you should are. totally follow them and watch them play EverQuest 2 because it is a great game. Um, and I do miss it. I really, I really do miss it. I hadn't realized how much I missed it until you guys started talking about it before the stream. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> man, I remember this, 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 and this. And it's like, I don't have any time right now. So One of these days. It'll be there for a while. All right. I will see everybody in game on Friday. Servers go up at noon central time. So for those of you who are in alpha, we will see you then. And for everybody else, we will see you next Tuesday at 2 o'clock central time. Yep, and we have a schedule in the description if you if you need to write it down or something. But anyway, thank you all for stopping by, and I will probably be streaming EverQuest 2 in a few hours, so I will see you guys then. <laughs>